بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام الأتمان الأكملان على خير خلق الله أجمعين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وأرنا الحق حقا ورزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا ورزقنا اجتنابه واجعلنا ممن يستمعون القول فيتبعون أحسنه وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Last week we looked at how the peace treaty that was between the Muslims and Quraysh that they had agreed upon at Hudaybiyah how this peace treaty had been breached by Quraysh and its allies and the treaty was meant to go on for 10 years but it was already violated less than two years into it so now we mentioned how Quraysh they went into a frenzy worrying about what's going to happen next so they sent Abu Sufyan all the way to Medina to try to agree with the Prophet وسلم, to revalidate the treaty and even extend it and we looked at his visit to Medina and how he returned to Mecca in utter humiliation so the attempts of Quraysh to basically repair the damage it all failed and now Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa had made up his mind to advance to Mecca for what would be the one major event in the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and that is Fath Mecca, the conquest of Mecca. So we're going to start looking at this major event from today and we'll continue on with it. Uh, next week insha'Allah now initially as we mentioned last week the Prophet وسلم, he concealed his plans we mentioned how Abu Bakr an noticed his daughter Aisha was preparing food that she would normally prepare for when the Prophet وسلم, would go out on a journey and specifically when he would go out uh, for battle and so Abu Bakr asked her what was going on and she did not let out any information. But eventually, eventually the Prophet وسلم, started to uh, let the Sahaba know about his plans so that they could get ready for this battle. However, the Prophet وسلم, gave strict instructions to everyone to keep this a secret you know this journey and this plan was not to be let out the plans were not to be let out to anyone outside of medina and so the prophet ﷺ did not want quraysh to even get the slightest of hints of the fact that he was advancing towards mecca and this time it was going to be even more difficult to do that, to keep it a secret. Why? Because of how huge you know, his force was this time, as we're going to see. And so such a huge force going all the way to Mecca, you know, it's going to be difficult to uh, conceal uh, the plans. Uh, however, nonetheless, the Prophet wasallam did what he could. He did what he could to try to make sure that no information was leaked. And so in order to do this, he took several measures. Number one, he sent out a fake sariyah, an expedition of eight men under the leadership of Abu Qatada radiallahu an, to a place called Batun Ilam, which is north of Medina. And so the purpose of this was to deceive the enemy that if people think he's 
going out, you know, to fight someone, they'll think he's going northwards, which is the opposite direction of Mecca. And so Abu Qatada and his men, they, they reach this area and they don't find any enemy and no threat. There's nothing there. So they return. On their way back, they get news that the Prophet ﷺ has already left Medina on his way to Mecca. And so they, they joined. Number two, the Prophet ﷺ sent spies and monitors in and around Medina. And so he put Umar ibn Khattab in charge of these spies and monitors. And they were supposed to be stationed at different places in and around Medina. And he gave them instructions to not allow anyone from outside Medina to have passage into or even near Medina. And for these monitors to carefully watch anyone who seemed to be leaving Medina heading towards Mecca. Thirdly, and as we have seen throughout the seerah, after the Prophet ﷺ would take the means that he was able to, that are in his hands, whatever he is able to do, in order to achieve his goal, he would then put his trust in Allah, and he would ask Allah for his aid and his help. So here, even this time, it was no different. The Prophet ﷺ, he made dua to Allah. He said, Oh Allah, take away their hearing and their sight so that they are not able to see us until we come upon them by surprise and so that they do not hear us except upon a sudden. Now, one day, the Prophet ﷺ got Ali ibn Abi Talib and Zubair ibn al-Awam and al-Miqdad ibn al-Aswad, these three companions, he got them together. And he told them he was going to send them on a mission. Ali radiallahu an narrates the story himself and it's found in Sahih al-Bukhari. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to the three of them, I want you to go to a place called Rawlat Khakh. There you will find a woman and she has a letter with her. I want you to bring that letter to me. Ali radiallahu anh says that we set out with our horses and we ran at full pace until we reached the place where we found the lady. He says we went up to her and we said, give us the letter that you have. The woman, she said, I don't have any letter. So Ali radiallahu anh said, either you give us a letter or we're going to strip you of your clothes. Meaning we're going to strip search you. Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us that you have a letter and so you have a letter. So when she saw that they were serious, she asked them to step aside and then she took it out, she took out the letter from her braid. She had it hidden in her hair. Ali radiallahu anh says, we then brought the letter to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he opened it and he found how this it was a letter that contained a message from Hatib ibn Abi Balta'a, the companion, to some of the mushrikun of Mecca, informing them of some of the plans of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so here we have a major security and intelligence breach. Here you had one of the Muslims, Hatib ibn Abi Balta'a radiallahu an, acting as a secret agent for the kuffar among the Muslims, passing on intelligence information to the enemy. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa read the letter, he called Hatib. 
and he asked him, Oh, Hatib, what is this? Hatib, he replied, O oh, Messenger of Allah, don't hurry in giving your judgment about me. I was a man closely connected with Quraysh, but I did not belong to their tribe. While the other Muhajirun with you, who left Mecca, they had their relatives in Mecca who would protect their families and their properties. So I wanted to make up for my lack of blood relation to Quraysh by doing them a favor, by informing them of your plans so that they may protect my family. And in one narration it says that it was his mother that he was worried about. He says, I did not do this because of kufr or irtidad, apostasy, nor out of preferring kufr over Islam. And so here we see why this companion did what he did. He had left Mecca with all the other Muslims when they made hijrah to Medina. But he was different. He did not have, he did not belong to Quraysh like the rest of the Muhajirun. But he left behind family and wealth and property. He was worried that if the Prophet now comes into Mecca with his army and there's fighting and whatnot, that the kuffar of, of Mecca, they're going to take revenge. They're going to kill all the Muslims there or the relatives of Hatib because they don't have any protection. They're not from Quraysh and they'll confiscate his, his property, his wealth, etc. The Prophet wasallam, he said to the companions around him, he said, Hatib has told you the truth. Now, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an was there. And he said, O Messenger of Allah, allow me to chop off the head of this munafiq, this hypocrite. The Prophet sallallahu said, Hatib participated in the battle of Badr. And who knows? Perhaps Allah has already looked at the participants of Badr and said, اِعْمَلُوا مَا شِئْتُمْ فَقَدْ غَفَرَتُوا لَكُمْ Do as you please, do whatever you want, because I have already forgiven you. Now we mentioned this hadith when we spoke about the status of the people of Badr. And it went to prove how their status is as a group is the highest among all the companions. So here Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam did not say that Hatib radiallahu an did not deserve to be killed. He didn't respond to Umar radiallahu an or to what Umar radiallahu an had said regarding Hatib being a hypocrite. Rather, he clarified that the reason he should not be killed is because he participated in a great event, and that is the Battle of Badr. And so this shows us the high status of those who participated in that battle. But nonetheless, the Prophet wasallam excused Hatib radiallahu an. And he did not punish him, he did not take any further action against him. Now, after this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed which surah? Suratul Mumtahana. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu la tattakhidu aduwi wa aduwakum awliya tulquna ilayhim bil mawaddah wa qad kafaru bima jaakum min al haq يُخْرِجُونَ الرَّسُولَ وَإِيَّاكُمْ أَنْ تُؤْمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ رَبِّكُمْ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ خَرَجْتُمْ جِهَادًا فِي سَبِيلِي وَابْتِغَاءَ مَرْضَاتِي تُسِرُّونَ إِلَيْهِمْ بِالْمَوَدَّةِ وَأَنَا أَعْلَمُ بِمَا أَخْفَيْتُمْ وَمَا أَعْلَنْتُمْ وَمَنْ يَفْعَلْهُ مِنْكُمْ فَقَدْ ضَلَّ سَوَاءَ السَّبِيلِ And the rest of the ayat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O oh, you who believe, do not 
Take my enemies and your enemies as trusted allies. Don't ally with the enemies of Islam. Showing them affection, even though they deny what has come to you of the truth. They drove the messenger and yourselves out, meaning out of Mecca, simply for your belief in Allah, your Lord. If you truly come out for jihad in my cause and seek my pleasure, then do not take them as allies, disclosing secrets to them out of affection towards them. When I know best whatever you conceal and whatever you reveal, and whoever of you does this has truly strayed far from the right way. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rebukes the likes of Hatib radiallahu an that this is not what a Muslim is supposed to do. Now after this, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa marches forth for Mecca and this was in the month of Ramadan. Precisely the 10th of Ramadan of the 8th year of the Hijrah is when they left al Medina. The force that the Prophet ﷺ had gathered was an army of 10,000 men strong. It was the largest army assembled by the Prophet ﷺ thus far. It consisted of all of the Muhajirun and all of the Ansar along with some of the tribes that surrounded Medina like Sulaym, Aslam, Ghifar, Muzayna and others. And so this shows us what we previously mentioned after the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. The Treaty of Hudaybiyah as we mentioned was a golden opportunity to spread the da'wah. And we mentioned those who attended at Hudaybiyah were only 1,400 of the Sahaba. But now you have 10,000. This shows us that the da'wah had spread during this small period of time. Now in the initial part of the journey, it's Ramadan and the Muslims were fasting. But when they were getting closer to Mecca, the Prophet ﷺ ordered the Muslims to break their fast. And he took some water and he drank it in front of them to basically lead by example. And so they broke their fast for the remainder of the journey. Now on the way, there were a few notable individuals who came from Mecca to join the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Among them were, first of all, Al-Abbas Ibn Abdul Muttalib radiallahu an, the uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We already mentioned how Al-Abbas, he had already accepted Islam previously. And we mentioned how he stayed behind in Mecca and he kept his Islam as a secret. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made use of him as a spy who he could depend on to you know, send him information about what's going on in Mecca. But now Al-Abbas radiallahu anhu, he had made up his mind to leave Mecca and make hijrah to Medina. And so he left with his family. And coincidentally, they meet the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as he was coming and it's mentioned that uh, they met uh, at a place called Al Juhfa which is closer to Medina but in between Mecca and Al Medina and so Al Abbas joined the army another individual who left Mecca was Abu Sufyan Ibn Al Harith Ibn Abd Al Muttalib not the famous Abu Sufyan, we're going to talk about him shortly. But this Abu Sufyan, he is the cousin of the Prophet ﷺ. Abu Sufyan ibn al-Harith ibn Abd al-Muttalib. He was not only the cousin of the Prophet ﷺ, but 
he was also his brother from breastfeeding. And the third individual who left Mecca to meet the Prophet وسلم, was Abdullah ibn Abi Umayyah ibn al mughira And he was the stepbrother of Umm Salama, the wife of the Prophet Now both of these two men, Abu Sufyan ibn al-Harith and Abdullah ibn Umayyah were staunch enemies of the Prophet who had waged years of war and before the wars, persecution of the Muslims in Mecca. Abdullah ibn Abi Umayyah is the son of Abi Umayyah. He's from that family that, you know, uh, was staunch in their hostility to the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims. And he was no different. He was, he used to persecute the Muslims. He would mock the Prophet ﷺ. And he participated in all of the battles against the Prophet ﷺ. When the Prophet ﷺ heard of these two men, he didn't even want to meet them. This is how much, this is how much he hated these two men. They were leaders of Quraysh. However, they had come to sincerely accept Islam. Like we mentioned previously, Khalid ibn al-Walid, Amr ibn al-As, and so these two men had also left Mecca after seeing that, you know, that's it. The future is for Islam. Allah had guided their hearts and now they had come to accept Islam. So although initially the Prophet ﷺ did not even want to see their faces, Umm Salama, she managed to convince the Prophet ﷺ to basically accept them. And so he met them and he accepted their pledge and you know they accepted Islam at his hands and they joined the army now both of these two men to show how sincere they were they went on to basically defend Islam and the Prophet shortly after the conquest of Mecca not too far after we have in the battle of Hunayn which we're going to talk about after the conquest of Mecca, Abu Sufyan ibn al-Harith, he would stand with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam all the way until the end. And we're going to talk about the battle of Hunayn and how difficult it became, how a lot of people left uh, the army and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam stood ground with only a few of the companions. Among them was Sufyan ibn al uh, Abu Sufyan ibn al-Harith. As for Abdullah ibn Abi Umayyah, then when the Prophet ﷺ went out to lay siege to at Ta'if, which was also right after the conquest of Mecca, and we're going to talk about that. In the siege of at Ta'if, he stood ground as well until he was killed, and so he was martyred. He died as a shaheed in the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ. So now the Muslims were reaching close to Mecca. Up until this moment, Quraysh were not aware of this massive army approaching them. This was, as we said, due to the smart moves and precautionary measures that the Prophet ﷺ made in making sure that no news would reach Mecca. On the other hand, as we have seen throughout the seerah, whenever Quraysh would make a move, Whenever they were prepared for battle, Rasulullah would immediately be alerted. And so this shows us that the intelligence gathering of the Prophet was at a much higher caliber than that of Quraysh. Even though their resources, the resources of the Muslims and their abilities were much less compared to that of Quraysh. The Muslims were few in number. And they were only located in and around Medina. Whereas Quraysh has 
all of Hijaz and you know all the other tribes, the major tribes of Arabia are with them. But yet, we see how the intelligence of the Prophet wasallam was far more superior. So now the Muslims reach a place called Mar al-Zahran, which is just north of Mecca. And here Rasulullah gave them orders to camp for the night. And he told them to light fires. It's mentioned that 10,000 fires were lit to give them light. Now it so happened that Abu Sufyan ibn al-Harb, the other Abu Sufyan, the leader of Quraysh, along with two other men, Budayl ibn Warqa and Hakim ibn Hizam. They had come out of Mecca scouting for information on the possibility of the Muslims coming. Now, this was not based on any intelligence that reached them. As we mentioned, the Prophet ﷺ was successful in making sure no information leaks and reaches Mecca. So they never came out because they got word, but only based on suspicion. Why? Because as we mentioned, Abu Sufyan had returned from Medina without any success in you know, renewing the, the, the peace treaty. And so he was worried that you know, maybe the Muslims are going to come. And so he, along with these two men, they went out and they were basically looking for travelers who could give them in, any information that they had on, you know, on the possibility of the Muslims leaving Medina, heading towards Mecca. So at night, they were close to the Muslim army. And they saw the lights of this huge encampment. Abu Sufyan asked, who are these? Budayl ibn Warqa. Remember, Budayl ibn Warqa, we mentioned him previously. He is from Khuza'a, the tribe that had allied with the Prophet So Budayl ibn Warqa, he says, this is Khuza'a preparing for war. Abu Sufyan, being a very intelligent and wise man, he said, no. Khuza'a is much less than this. Their numbers are much less than what we see here. This cannot be Khuza'a. Meanwhile, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he had his army well protected. So he had guards all around. So some of these guards, they came across these three men and they arrested them and took them to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In one narration, it says that it was Al-Abbas who came across them. When he saw, he recognized Abu Sufyan. He told him, come with me. You better hurry up and meet the Prophet sallallahu If any Muslim sees you, they're going to kill you. So he took Abu Sufyan with him. And as they're rushing to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Guess who sees Abu Sufyan? Umar ibn Khattab. And he recognizes him. And he says, This is Abu Sufyan. We have to kill him. But Al Abbas, he protected him. He protected Abu Sufyan and he rushed with him to the Prophet before Umar could reach him. So now when they reach the Prophet, Umar radiallahu anhu is trying to convince the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to have Abu Sufyan killed while Al-Abbas was appealing to him to spare his life. So as they were arguing, Al-Abbas radiallahu anhu, he got angry and he said to Umar, if he was one of Banu Adi, Banu Adi is a family from Quraysh, of which Umar radiallahu anhu, he belongs to that family. 
So Al Abbas says to Umar, if he was one of Banu Adi from your clan, you would not have said so. Meaning, you would not have said, let's kill him. But because you know he is from Banu Abd Manaf, who is Banu Abd Manaf, they are the family of both the Prophet وسلم, and Abu Sufyan. And so, hearing this, Umar radiallahu an, he stepped back. And he said to Al-Abbas, wait a second. Wait a second, Al-Abbas. Your Islam is more beloved to me than the Islam of my own father, Al-Khattab, if he had become a Muslim. Because I know that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would become more pleased by the Islam of you than if my father was to become a Muslim. And so here Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, he, diffu- he diffused this you know, potential war that was going to erupt between him and Al-Abbas and obviously the families of both of these companions. Anyways, we're going to come back to this statement of Umar radiallahu anhu. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then told them to go and come back in the morning. So when he met them the following morning, he offered these three men to accept Islam and then they would be safe. So Budayl ibn Warqa and Hakim ibn Hizam, they accepted Islam right away. As for Abu Sufyan, now remember, who is Abu Sufyan? He is now the de facto leader of Quraysh. And we know his years of enmity against Rasulullah He was the last remaining senior of Quraysh, with all the senior leaders either having been killed or some of them accepting Islam. That's it, he's, only, he's the only one left now. And so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked him, Abu Sufyan, do you recognize that there is no God except the one? Abu Sufyan said, how generous and kind you are. If there were any gods besides Allah, then they would have given us protection and they would have defended us so here Abu Sufyan has accepted the premise that only Allah deserves to be worshipped thus renouncing his belief in his idols and false gods he has accepted the first part of the shahada then Rasulullah says isn't it time Abu, o Abu Sufyan that you testify that I am the messenger of Allah. To this Abu Sufyan, he said, there's something in my heart against this until this very moment. And so here he accepted the first part of the Shahada, but now he was having a difficult time accepting the second part. Showing us that for many of these leaders of Quraysh, it was a power struggle. They didn't want to accept Islam because they didn't want to see the authority going to someone else other than themselves. It was a matter of leadership. And in this case, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the leader. I don't want to bring myself under him because I am the leader of my people. Right? So then Al-Abbas radiallahu anhu, he said, Woe to you, O Abu Sufyan! Testify by the shahada, meaning both shahadas, become a Muslim before your head is chopped off. Then Abu Sufyan, he said, وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدَ الرَّسُولَ اللَّهِ Right then and there, he said, and I testify that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. And so this is how Abu Sufyan finally 
accepted Islam. Then Al-Abbas radiallahu anhu, he told Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that, look, Abu Sufyan is a man who loves status and position. And we could see this as we have seen so far. Al-Abbas said, he loves that. So, O Messenger of Allah, give him something. Give him something. So the Prophet ﷺ said, We are now about to enter Mecca. Whoever enters the home of Abu Sufyan is safe. Whoever closes his door is safe. And whoever enters the masjid is safe. Rasulullah ﷺ then gave instructions to Al-Abbas to hold Abu Sufyan back from leaving and to have him wait by the mountain pass. Now there was a reason for this which we're going to come to later. The Prophet ﷺ had divided the army into battalions. And each battalion had a banner and they were divided according to their respective tribes. So each battalion was passing through this mountain pass one by one because it was narrow and the entire army couldn't go through. So as each battalion came through the mountain pass, Abu Sufyan was standing there with Al-Abbas. He would see one battalion coming through. He would ask Al-Abbas, who are these? Al-Abbas would say, they are so-and-so. They are Ghifar, they are Sulaym, Muzayna. Whenever he would mention this, Abu Sufyan would say, what do I have to do with Ghifar? What do I have to do with Muzayna? What do I have to do with Aslam? These tribes are nobody. I am from Quraysh. What do I have to do with these people and, their, and these tribes? You could see how you know, tribalism was rooted in his heart. However, one particular battalion caught his attention. He asked, who are these? Al-Abbas said, these are the Ansar. And so he noticed something different about them. He noticed power and strength. And so the banner of the Ansar was with who? With Sa'ad ibn Ubadah. And he was the leader of Al-Khazraj before Islam. He was one of the best companions of the Prophet ﷺ. When Sa'ad ibn Ubadah saw Abu Sufyan, he said to him, Today is the day, Al-Yawm Yawm Al-Malhama. Today is the day of the epic battle. Today is the day in which the sanctity of the Kaaba will be violated. Meaning, the Haram, no bloodshed is allowed there. But on this day, it will happen. So here, Sa'ad ibn Ubadah radiallahu an, he was taken away by his valor, his enthusiasm for, you know, what was happening, which led him to say these words. News of his words reached the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Sa'ad is mistaken. Rather, this day is the day in which Allah will honor the Kaaba. Meaning that the sanctity of the Kaaba will not be violated and that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not have any intentions to shed any blood in Mecca. Then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ordered that the banner of the Ansar be taken away from Sa'ad ibn Ubadah and be given to his son Qais. And this was for two reasons. Number one, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not want Sa'ad ibn Ubadah to have authority when he could potentially misuse it and cause bloodshed in Mecca. And Rasulullah sallallahu was doing everything he could to avoid that from happening. He had no intentions of shedding any blood in Mecca. And secondly, 
At the same time, the Prophet ﷺ did not want to hurt the feelings of this great companion. Of course, Sa'ad ibn Ubadah would comply with the orders of the Prophet ﷺ and would not rebel against his decision. Right? But there would probably remain something in his heart for being stripped of the banner. So this is why the Prophet ﷺ handed it over to his son. Right? To his son Qais. So that he feels that it's still with me. And so these were the events leading up to the conquest of Mecca. Next week, we're going to basically talk about how the Prophet ﷺ entered Mecca and what happened after that. We're going to conclude with just a few lessons that we learned from what we have gone through today. The first lesson that we learned, what is the ruling of spying for the enemy? We see what Hatib ibn Abi Balta did, sending the letter to Mecca, and he was caught. The scholars have differed. Some say it is an act of kufr. Others say it's a major sin. But from the story of Hatib we can see based on what he himself said that it is most likely an act of kufr. What did he say to the Prophet O oh, Messenger of Allah, I did not do this because of kufr or apostasy, nor because I preferred kufr over Islam. So he considered it to be an act of kufr and apostasy which is why he is saying here that he didn't do it because of that. If he didn't consider it to be an act of kufr, why would he? Why would he say that? So he considered the act itself to be kufr, but he was clarifying what was in his heart. He was he was saying that I did not intend that. We also see in the reaction of Umar radiallahu an a proof that this is an act of kufr, right? He proposed to the Prophet ﷺ to kill him because he is a munafiq. Only a hypocrite. Only a hypocrite would do something like this. Again, if Umar did not consider it to be an act of kufr or nifaq, then why would he ask the Prophet ﷺ to allow him to kill Halatib? And so to all those Muslims out there who allow themselves to basically work as agents for the kuffar, spying on the Muslims, conveying information about the Muslims to the enemies, they have committed an act of apostasy, an act of kufr. They are considered to be munafiqun. And so it's not a light matter. It's something dangerous. So sometimes we're approached by intelligence agencies and this started to happen a lot after 9-11. And either out of pressure or because of the money that they were offered, many Muslims, they gave in and they worked for the kuffar against the Muslims. And so these people need to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before it's too late. The second lesson, the strong sense of loyalty among the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. We see this in how Rasulullah ﷺ had disciplined the Sahaba to keep secrets of the state as top secret and not disclose them to anyone. On the other hand, he would train them to be on alert of the enemy movements, bringing him any intelligence uh, of the kuffar and what they're planning on doing. We mentioned how this made the intelligence gathering of the Muslims to be superior, more superior to that of Quraysh. Even though the resources of the Muslims was, was much less. So because of their loyalty to Allah and His Messenger, and the Muslims, the Sahaba, would not leak any information 
that would harm and endanger Islam and the Muslims to the enemies. The case of Hatib was an individual case, right? It was an exception. And we showed how the Prophet was immediately informed, right? And this was to Wahid. How did the Prophet find out that Hatib had sent a letter? Hmm? Jibreel came to him and told him. The point here is that the Sahaba عنهم, would not disclose any information about the Muslims to the Kuffar due to what? Due to their al wala wal bara. Right? Due to their loyalty. One of the things that we Muslims suffer from today is a lack of loyalty, a lack of al wala. And you know, not having a proper understanding of this important concept in Islam of al wala wal bara. So many Muslims today are not only willing to give information to you know uh, to the kuffar on you know on a single incident basis, but rather they're willing to work long term for the kuffar giving them information about the Muslims. The third lesson that we learn is that Muslims do not think along tribal or nationalistic lines. We see this in the dialogue that took place between Umar ibn Khattab and Al-Abbas And so when their argument got heated and Al-Abbas said what he said to Umar and then how Umar responded, he said, Look, O Abbas, you know, your Islam is more beloved to me than that of my father if he was to become a Muslim. Umar was making it clear to Al Abbas that this is not how we Muslims think. What did Al Abbas say? He had said that basically he was putting down the family of Umar radiallahu anhu. You know, Umar radiallahu anhu wanted to kill Abu Sufyan. And Al Abbas said, if he was from your family, you wouldn't be saying this. But because he's from our family, you're saying this. And so Umar radiallahu anhu responded to him and said, no. Well, Abbas, we don't think like this. We Muslims do not think like this. We do not behave like this. We don't think along tribal lines. He was saying that he was more happy over the Islam of Al Abbas because he was the uncle of Rasulullah and that must be beloved to the Prophet And so, whatever pleases Rasulullah it pleases me. Whatever displeases the Prophet it is displeasing to me. And so Umar was giving Al-Abbas a lesson in how we Muslims think. We do not view things from a tribal or nationalistic view. We Muslims, we base things on our Al-Wala wal bara If a person is close to Allah, then we are loyal to that person. If a person is far away from Allah, then we disassociate ourselves from them. It doesn't matter who they are. The final lesson that we can mention is waging a psychological warfare or a psychological battle. When Rasulullah gave instructions to Al Abbas to hold Abu Sufyan back from leaving after he had accepted Islam. And to have him wait by the mountain pass, there was a reason for this. When Abu Sufyan would see the overwhelming forces and strength of the Muslim army, they were 10,000 strong on their way to Mecca. When Abu Sufyan would see this, he would see one battalion after the, after the other coming through this mountain pass and he would see the strength of the Muslims that this is what the Prophet ﷺ had brought to conquer Mecca it would put an end to any thought of resistance 
Because although Abu Sufyan had just accepted Islam, he was still a new Muslim. And he was still a leader of his people. And if he goes back to Mecca, his people may not be willing to surrender. And so they may want to put up a fight. If Abu Sufyan didn't see this, right? If he didn't, if the Prophet did not show him his army, then he would have gone back to Mecca thinking, well, let's fight because we have fought them in many other battles. Now Rasulullah was well prepared for war. Let us not think that he could not fight Quraysh. He, he came well prepared and his army could easily enter Mecca defeating any resistance. But what did we mention? The Prophet ﷺ had no plans of shedding any blood in Mecca. He didn't want to do that this time. And so here he wanted Abu Sufyan to see how strong the Muslims were so that they would just surrender. And so this psychological tactic, it worked. And when Abu Sufyan went, when he saw this, he went back to Mecca. But before he went back to Mecca, he told Al-Abbas, he said, no one can defeat these people. He said, by Allah, Abu Al-Fadl. Abu Al-Fadl is Al-Abbas. He said, by Allah, O Abu Fadl, the kingdom of your nephew has become great today. He's talking about the Prophet Al-Abbas said, not kingdom, Abu Sufyan, but rather it is prophethood. Again, look at how Abu Sufyan is thinking. All he's thinking about is power and authority and kingdom and leadership. So anyways, Abu Sufyan, he went back to Mecca and he told everyone about what he saw and conveyed the message of Rasulullah that whoever enters the home of Abu Sufyan is safe, whoever closes their door is safe, and whoever enters the masjid is safe. And so after this next week we'll move on to what happens, how the Muslims enter Mecca, and what happens after that. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk wa salli Allahumma wa sallim ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh